You're watching DHTV from California State University to Vegas Hills. Hello and welcome back to Theater 100 Television, Film and Theater. My name is Naomi Buckley and I am the instructor for this course. Um, we are in session four and I do want to remind you that as always today, as opposed to the week I was sick, we are usually live and online. Um, if you'd like to call in and talk with us today, you can do so at 310-298-7330 or you can type in a question or a comment to Live at gmail.com. Of course, if you do type in or call in today, you'll get extra credit. This week is just regular extra credit, not double like last week, but um, always worth it for you to um, accrue those extra credit points to provide a little cushion for later. Today we're going to be looking at theater spaces, um, or another word for that is stages or scenery, and we're going to be talking about that. And then in the first part of the broadcast, we are going to be looking at doing some theater history and looking at restoration theater. Um, before we do either of those things today, I do want to get to our question of the day, so your extra credit opportunity. What do you think would be the best staging format to see a play in? Proscenium, arena, or thrust? And why, do you, why would you want to use one over the other? So if you'd like to uh, type in or call in to answer that question today, you can get some extra credit. Um, as always, even if you just have a comment or a question that you'd like to add, um, into the, the broadcast today. Um, we'll give you extra credit for that too. We just love that you're watching and we want to encourage you to participate. Um, and you never know your comment or question uh, might lead to other people commenting and questioning or something new that I might share as well. All right. Um, as usual, I do want to just remind you that this week is a, a fairly normal week. You're going to have a quiz on Sunday. You're going to have your discussion board due on Sunday. Um, and so just like the weeks previous, you've got the lecture, then the discussion board, and the quiz that are all due on Sunday this week. Next week, we are going to be going over Raisin in the Sun, and that week is going to be a little bit different. I would honestly suggest that you kind of go ahead in our assignments page, look ahead into that assignments page, and just take a peek at what the assignment for the week is. If you haven't bought Raisin in the Sun yet, you need to go on Amazon Prime and one day prime that because you're going to need it. Um, in order to do your assignment for next week and your discussion board, everything. So um, wh what we go over in class next week in terms of Raisin in the Sun is going to be uh, abbreviated. We're not going over, you know, we're not reading the whole play in class. We certainly don't have time for that. We're not watching the whole play in class. So if you don't have access to the play, it's going to be problematic for you. So please make sure that you have access to that um, and you're able to... Um, get to read it so that next week by Sunday you can do all the things you need to do and have those assignments in on time. All right, so today we're going to be talking about restoration theater, um, <clears throat> which is also uh, takes place in the 18th century. It's centered in uh, London and the UK. And um, it's really an example of kind of like the pendulum of history and how things swing back and forth, how audiences as well as political bodies um, swing back and forth throughout history. So uh, it's, it's got an interesting history, the, the restoration, because it started out um, with the Puritans and uh, the English Civil War. So back in 1642, I, there was a civil war. There was a clash in, in England. There was a clash between two warring ideologies. The tradition of the monarchy that had been around at that point for obviously um, some several hundreds of years, kings and queens who had ruled England, um, <clears throat> and a group of people that wanted to start a commonwealth. And it was driven by religious ideology. It was driven by a group of people called the Puritans. And the Puritans are um, a... a Protestant base group of people. So what does that mean? Well, the Protestants, as opposed to Catholics, and opposed to the Church of England, which was kind of like Catholic light at the time, um, <clears throat> believed 
that uh, in, if you're not familiar with Catholicism, kind of all the Catholic structures. So they definitely believed in uh, God and they believed that there was a Jesus and they believed in the Bible and they believed in the Old and the New Testament. Um, they believed in the crucifixion of Christ, but the Catholics also believed in a host of saints. They believed in the, um, the Mother Mary being um, you know, a saint as well. They believed in uh, this certain sacraments that people had to do in order to get into heaven. And those sacraments, or if we can think of them maybe as devotions, things that people needed to accomplish in their life in order to secure their place in heaven, um, had become really uh, pretty elaborate at this point in time. Um, maybe not quite as elaborate as they had been in the previous, uh, you know, 100 years, but certainly much more elaborate than we would consider today, even with good Catholics. Um, certainly there were the basic sacraments of uh, you're supposed to get married, you're supposed to have kids, you're supposed to go to confession, you're supposed to uh, go to church and mass and all those things and uh, pray. But there were lots of other things too. Uh, there were uh, pilgrimages that usually people were supposed to go on, these kind of journeys that you would take to certain holy sites um, throughout uh, the UK. And then there was uh, tithing money that you were supposed to give in order uh, to, as a sacrifice to God, right? Um, and regular tithing at the church. Um, in fact, there had become a, a practice at this point in time in which there was also um, you paying to give confession, right? To be get forgiven of your sins. And so there certainly was a level of corruptness uh, that existed. At this point in time as well, it's, it's probably good to mention that <clears throat> the, the English had separated from the Catholic Church, right? So when um, Henry VIII decided that he wanted to divorce his uh, first wife, and the, the Catherine of Aragon and the Pope said, no way, I'm not going to grant that annulment, basically, because they didn't have divorce, but an annulment of the marriage. Um, Henry decided to break away from the Catholic Church and start his own church, the Church of England. But the Church of England was really pretty much just like a, a Catholic Church, right? They followed all of the same ideas. So the Puritans were a Protestant religion that believed uh, one of the key differences between the, the Protestant religion and the, Cat, the Catholic religions as well as the Church of England was that the Protestants believed that everyday people could have direct connection to God and everyday people could pray to God on their own. They could confess their sins to God on their own. They could read the Bible and interpret it on their own and they could have a personal relationship with God that did not require these intermediary things. They didn't require priests, they didn't require penance, they didn't require any of these things. You could do this on your own as um, just as an individual, right? Um, at the time, the Catholic Church believed that that was heretical. Uh, the Church of England had a much more lenient view of it because again, they're like Catholic light. Um, but still there was, it, it was uh, Puritanism, which is Protestantism is just another form of Protestantism, was a real challenge to the hierarchy and the power that was represented by the church, right? The church had accrued all this power, religion had accrued all this power over time, and the monarchy was aligned primarily with this, the, these, these power structures. In fact, drew their, a lot of their power from aligning themselves with these power structures. And so Protestantism in pretty much all of its forms was considered by the Catholic Church and by many of the monarchies throughout Europe a really, really big threat and considered heretical. What does that mean? Well, it means that it's so against what they believed were the teachings of the Bible and of the church so as to be heresy, and heresy was punishable by death. So it's a, a hanging crime, as we might say, right? Um, so the Puritans looked upon the monarchy and the church that they aligned themselves with as being corrupt, as being uh, too secular. Um, they believed that the monarchy had allowed too much secularism into the country and that they were allowing the country to kind of go down the tubes because they were not following what, what the Puritans believed were the teachings of God um, and that they had become power hungry and greedy and the Puritans were there to stand up against that. 
and to uh, enact their own ideas and beliefs into England. And so there was a civil war. There was a, a fight within the country between those people who were um, with the monarchy, the monarchists, and the, the rebellion who were with the Puritans who wanted to establish something called the Commonwealth. Well, in that battle, the Puritans won. And they dethroned the king at the time, who was Charles I, and they executed him and his wife, I believe, as well, and some of his family. And the rest of his family and his court actually were able to flee to the south of France, to Normandy, and lived there in exile for many, many years. So the Commonwealth, uh, the all of England became under the Commonwealth, and uh, James Cromwell was the leader of the Commonwealth, and he was a Puritan himself, and so he became the head of the state, and um, and he ruled for uh, you know many years in that capacity. While he was ruling in that capacity, um, the they enacted a lot of laws that were in line with what they believed was the the direction they wanted the country to go. So we, we know that they came into power because they believed that the monarchy had become too secular and corrupt and greedy. And so part of the things that the, the laws that they enacted had to do with um, leading the country and creating laws that conformed to the types of religious beliefs that they had. And why is that important? Well, it's important because the Puritans believed that theater, in fact, any form of entertainment, that was not glorifying God um, was sinful. And so even though if we look right before this period, right, literally right before this period, we get the Elizabethan era, right, and we get this flourishing of theater, we get the Renaissance, we get the flourishing of theater and the arts, um, and specifically theater inside of England. This is when people uh, like Shakespeare were writing and we had the Old Globe and the Rose and all those things. Um, there is a real swing against all of those things. And uh, in fact, theater is outlawed. So the Puritans outlaw theater. It's not just theater that they outlaw. They outlaw a bunch of things, right? Um, but public performance in general is outlawed. And the theaters are closed down. They are shut down. And if you want to perform anything, it, has, it goes into this underground, right? So. They prevented any kind of public performances of theater from being performed in England for 20 years, basically. There was some loosening and laxening of that towards the end of Cromwell's life. He became a little older, and they felt was you know less important, and so people did still, certainly not openly, there weren't any public theaters. The theaters did not reopen. The people became a little less worried about um, advertising them, their performance performances. Um, in the meantime, what had happened was that while England was going through these, these growing pains and there was a whole switch over in terms of power and the structure of the state in England, the center of theater moved to France. So just across the channel um, over into France and who should be ha happen to be living in the south of France but the exiled son of the king Charles II. And Charles grows up in the south of France, it's a great picture of him, um, experiencing um, a, what was a renaissance of French theater. It's called the French neoclassical period, right, that happens. And this really becomes a flourishing of theater inside of France. This is where people uh, like Moliere are writing, um, famous play Tartuffe is, you know, written during this time, uh, and there's a real flourishing of the theater in France. And this is where Charles grows up. So in the meantime, back in England, Cromwell dies and his son comes to power. But the people that are in the, the around, you know, the, the body politic and the old politicians and the old courtiers and all that, they have been plotting for a while to bring the monarchy back. So Cromwell's death is a perfect opportunity for that. His son, who comes to power after him, James, is not nearly as uh, smart or well-liked and certainly doesn't have as much political sway and cachet as his father did. And so they see this as a perfect opportunity to kind of enact this coup 
and bring Charles II back, um, sneak him back into the country in the dead of night, which is exactly what they do, um, and have him or ordained um, and crowned king with a, uh, a religious person present to ordain that so that it's ordained by God so they can be recognized fully as a, a king of England. And um, that's exactly what they do. So they enact this coup and they bring him back across the channel in the dead of night in absolute secrecy. They have him uh, crowned and ordained and then they depose of James. I, I don't believe they kill him. They just send him out into exile and they remove all of uh, the people that were part of his uh, government and they restore the monarchy to England. And that is why, as you can see at the bottom of our screen in our lower thirds here, the Chiron says that this is called the Restoration. <laughs> well, that's why it's called the Restoration. It's because the monarchy had been absent from England for 20 some odd years. And when it's finally brought back and the monarchy is restored to the throne, we call that Restoration. So as soon as Charles gets back, one of the things that he does is he uh, lifts the ban on theater. Charles has been living in the south of France. This is where he grew up. He became a man in the south of France, and he had been exposed to all the courtly delights that the theater um, had to show, and he certainly wasn't going to have a country in which there was no theater present. And so he reopened the theaters. He lifted the ban. And so we see an immediate resurgence of, of theater inside of England. But the tone and tenor of, of the type of theater that gets produced here becomes uh, really, really different from what had come before. One of the other important things that Charles does, it's not immediate, but it, 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 pretty quickly after he arrives back, is he also lifts a ban, um, a long-standing ban, on women on the stage. So in France, uh, it had been a, quite a, women had been allowed on the stage for a very long time. In fact, they were one of the first people to allow women on the stage. And so Charles had grown up seeing women be on the stage. And to him, it was not at all odd or immoral or improper to see women on the stage, to see actresses. And so uh, he, uh, like I said, almost immediately also lifts the ban on that. And women are now for the first time in the history of England allowed to perform on the stage along with male actors. So England has lived in this puritanical, <laughs> under this puritanical government um, for 20 some odd years um, under the fear of punishment for all kinds of things, right? There was no public performances allowed. There was no singing, public singing, unless it was to God, right? There was no public dancing allowed. There, were no, there was no theater. You could get in a lot of trouble, be put in the stocks, or you know, worse, if you were found to be doing any of these things. Very, very strict, very religious um, community that, that was being created in the Commonwealth. And when Charles is restored, you can imagine, just like teenagers, young adults who, for the first time, have their freedom, that England goes crazy, <laughs> right? Uh, all the stuff that they couldn't do before is suddenly now they can do. Even women are allowed on the stage. And so the types of performances that we see that come out of this era, out of the Restoration, are uh, preoccupied with all the things that we see uh, teenagers and, and young adults preoccupied with, right? Preoccupied with sex, preoccupied with uh, debauchery, uh, drugs and drinking and parties and all these things. Um, all the plays are primarily comedies and when you go to see these shows, it's really just about having a lot of fun and laughing, right? So one of the first things that, that we see on the English stage is a play called The Country Wife. It's a perfect example of the type of theater that uh, we see throughout the Restoration period, um, 1675. It's got an opening scene that shows a total preoccupation with sex, like every other word that they're saying, even if you, if you read it now, you wouldn't get it because they're using words um, that don't resonate with us now, that represent certain body parts or are puns. Um, for sexual acts that we wouldn't get now because we don't call it those things. But it, the whole entire scene is basically that. It's one giant sexual pun. Um, and it follows the story of um, a guy who is goes out to the countryside 
and decides to that he's going to just seduce all these um, wives of all these rich husbands that live out there. And the way he's going to do it is going to be by pretending that he's a eunuch. A eunuch would have been a man who um, has had uh, a certain part of his body removed. I don't want to be too graphic. And is considered almost like a female because of it, right? So completely non-threatening, someone who's you know not interested in sex at all because he's been neutered, basically, right? Um, and, and so he goes out pretending he's a eunuch and uses this as a ploy to actually get into bed with all of these, the wives of these husbands. It's a, a very similar plot to a, a play that uh, probably Charles would have seen when he was living in the south of France called Tartuffe. And this was written by Moliere. And this is a play about a man who does a very similar thing. He goes out to the countryside to sleep with a bunch of uh, rich wives. And how does he get his way in the trust of all these husbands? Well, he says he's a priest and he pretends to be the most devout priest that you've ever seen. And so he convinces everybody that he's the most holy man. So of course he would never do anything like this. And then he proceeds to seduce every single one of these women. So these kinds of stories became hugely popular and people loved watching them on the stage. So there was this new intimacy in the stories that was reflected um, in the intimacy of the theaters themselves. Theaters moved completely indoors. So we had every theater that we had at the time was moved indoors. Um, they were lit primarily by, here's a great picture, they were lit by candlelight. They, as a result of them being indoors, um, they sat a lot less people. Uh, than they would have before. Um, an open air theater can sit five, well, goodness, the way that the Elizabethans packed them in, 1,000 to 2,000 people. An indoor theater like this could seat probably half of that. So the audiences became smaller. As a result of that, the ticket prices went up, right? Because we have less seats now, so we still have to make the same amount of money, so we got to sell the seats for more, right? And one of the th effects that this had was to create theater that was less for everyday people and more for the rich and the aristocrats. And so the other thing that we see in theater from this time is it tends to focus on that class of people, people who have money, because those were the people that were going to see the shows. They were the ones that could afford to see it. And so they, of course, enjoyed seeing themselves on the stage. Um, the theater goers were also not just there to watch the shows. This was an event. This was something, excuse me, that um, was a whole evening thing, right? Most of these shows were not, you know, now if we go see a show two hours, that's a pretty long play. We get an intermission, right? These plays were sometimes three, sometimes four hours when you added in the music that would be in between and the entertainment that would come before. This was a whole evening of entertainment, right? And the space was designed to encourage that. Um, in addition, these spaces did not have lighting. In fact, there was just no concept in the way that we have now of an, a specific, you know, like an audience space that's separate from the player space and a fourth wall and that the audience is supposed to be quiet while the performers are performing, right? That it was, that's a very, very modern concept and certainly did not exist at this point in time. So we're indoors and everything is lit by candles or usually these plays start around four when the sun is still out and we open these windows on the side that allow and in the back of the theater which allow all the daylight in. And then when it becomes dark in one of the intermission breaks, we light all the candles in the space and that's how we get light into the space. So, um, but there was no way to just light the stage or just light the house, right? And in candlelight, you know, even when you would have hundreds of candles, it's still fairly dark and dim with candlelight. So this is a, a, a space in which everything is lit. The audience is lit and the actors are lit at exactly the same level. And so people would go there to socialize um, and to oftentimes to meet, try to meet somebody. In fact, the way I usually like to describe it is that 
going to the theater was much more akin to something like we would think of today as like going to the club or going to a bar, right? Than it was to what we experience today in the theater, right? So we would go to the theater, it would be a whole evening affair, four hours probably. We would show up early for the early entertainment. There's people walking around selling food and drink, right? And I don't just mean water, I mean beer and wine. There's people selling oranges and turkey legs and all kinds of things inside. Everybody's there. They're dressed to the nines. You're dressed in your best clothes because you're there to attract a mate or a partner or something. Um, people are, are drunk and high, <laughs> right, because things like what we call snuff is, was very, very popular at the time and is basically just cocaine, right? And it was not illegal to do this. So, you know, people took drugs on a regular basis. They weren't illegal um, and they drank alcohol and they, you know, this, is, this was the experience of this entire space. And in the process of this, some actors are going to get on the stage and they're going to perform. And just in the same way that if you were at a concert or at a bar or a club where there was a band performing, yeah, you're there to watch the band or the, the, the performer, but you're also there to socialize and to see, be seen and to see others, right? So it was a very raucous atmosphere, very much unlike what we consider, you know, uh, the way the theater is now, where we go in and we sit down and we're very polite and quiet and there's no food or drink allowed inside of the theater and no camera, you know, like this is very, very structured and, and um, there's all this etiquette that we follow now, but this just really wasn't the way it was. It was a very lively place. It was... I mean, I think if you walked into it, it would just feel chaotic almost. And people were often not even paying attention to what was happening on the stage. Um, and because actors and uh, the audience, there was no idea of a fourth wall, right? This idea that the audience and the actors should ignore each other and pretend like, you know, we're separated by this invisible fourth wall, that didn't exist. Actors frequently talked back to audience members, and audience members frequently talked to the actors. If they thought the actors weren't doing a very good job, they might shout something at them, right? If the actors thought that somebody was being particularly loud during their special monologue, they might shout at them, right? So there was an interaction that simply, obviously, doesn't exist today in terms of audience and actor or performer interaction. Another thing that comes out of this time period because of that kind of interaction, um, something you might be familiar with, is if any of you have watched cartoons and you see, um, you know, or, or there's a lot of things that show this, right? Uh, somebody's performing and they're doing a really bad job and suddenly they start getting pelted with tomatoes, right? Rotten tomatoes. In fact, that's why that website that reviews films is called Rotten Tomatoes, right? Well, where that comes from, because obviously I'm sure none of you have ever seen that happen in real life, well, that comes from this time period because people were sat in these theaters and food was being served. And what kinds of food would be served? Well, you're not going to eat soup. You don't have a table, right? You just It's things you can hold in your hands. So think about the things you eat if you go to see a baseball game or um, you go like you know, to a place where there's not tables. It's got to be things that you can hold in your hand. So things like a turkey leg were fine, right? Um, but also a lot of self-contained fruits. So oranges, apples, bananas, tomatoes, things that you could hold in your hand and you could eat, right, without needing, you know, a plate and all these other things. And so if there was an actor on the stage that the audience particularly didn't like felt was doing a really bad job or they just didn't have a good relationship with they would literally take the food that they had in their hand and they would throw it at the actor that was on the stage and they would pelt it at them until that actor left <laughs> so this actually comes from a real moment in time where this was a very very common practice um, of audience having this very different relationship with the performers and food being an integral part of that whole experience and this is what would really really happen um, so in these theaters as I said they were much smaller they were about 500 seats which was again if we look back just less than 100 years before the Elizabethan stages could hold a thousand two thousand people it was a much much smaller space and um, 
a time in which men often outdid women in the terms of like the elaborate clothing that they would wear. And everybody, again, was just very, very dressed up in terms of the style of clothing. And when you, you know, it's like, again, today, if you go out to a club or a bar or whatever, you're going to put your, your nicest, hottest clothes, you know, the thing that you think makes you look the best. And this is exactly what these people were doing. Everybody was dressed up to the nines because it wasn't just about sitting in a dark space where nobody could see you. It was about sitting in a space where everybody could see you. In fact, that's the whole reason why you were there. You were there to meet other people, to be seen by other people, and you wanted to look your best, right? So not only were women for the first time performing on this stage, but women playwrights were contributing as well. So even though their plays were basically all about the same things, they were writing about all the same kinds of sexual situations that the men were writing about, um, for the first time we actually get women who are not only just allowed onto the stage, but allowed to participate in the writing of these stories. So people like Afro Ben and Susanna Centralive um, wrote plays that were very popular, um, and these were also plays about seduction, they were about the latest fashions, they were about witty repartee and social gossip, um, and featured you know, clear-cut characters, often kind of stereotypical uh, stock characters, just in the same way that the men did. Well, there is a wonderful play that was written about this time period called Stage Beauty, which was then turned into a film. Um, and this play and then film is about a woman who works as a uh, seamstress and costumer for a very, very famous male actor at this important turning point in history. Um, it's in the restoration period. It's when Charles II is now restored to the throne and he's lifted the ban off of women performing. So let's just take a second and imagine what that would have been like. Up until this moment, aside from the fact that theater had been banned and people had to do it in this underground way for 25, 30 years, right? <clears throat> not only that, but women for the whole of English history had not been allowed on the stage. So all the females' roles had been played by men. And in fact, this was like a specialty. Certain male actors would be chosen early on when you joined an acting company, you would be chosen early on if you, they thought you had the right characteristics to play the female parts. And there was a whole skill to it, right? Um, you know, you had to try to emulate the way a woman was. Now, of course, Everybody knew you weren't a woman, but that was the craft. That was part of it, right? That was the acting of it, was that you had to convince people, just like you, they also knew you weren't a really a king or you weren't really <laughs> Falstaff or any of these things. You were there to convince them that you were. So there was a real craft, and there were booklets written about it, how to uh, perform female parts, um, how to do it effectively, like what are the... the um, <laughs> I don't think we see it in this clip, but it's in there. There were these things called the seven poses of subjugation, right? There were these, these gestures that uh, men playing female parts could use in order to enhance their femininity on stage, and it showed certain things, right? In certain ways that they were supposed to move and hold themselves and use their voices in order to perform these parts. Um, so... Here we have this whole group of men who become very, very famous playing female parts um, and are so good at it that sometimes they even go out in public dressed as, the, as females, right? And I wouldn't say that this is necessarily like cross-dressing per se, but it is if you were famous looking like one thing, right? You become very famous looking at like one thing. If you walked out not looking like that thing, you know, no one's going to recognize you, but if you like that attention and you want to be recognized, then you need to go out looking like the thing that you're famous for, right? So it wasn't necessarily that these men were um, homosexual or, or transgendered, although I'm sure some of them were, um, but it was simply that they had created their whole career and their whole celebrity was based around this particular persona, and it was actually socially acceptable for that to happen. It was not considered wrong or taboo. It was more wrong and taboo for women to be on the stage doing this. So in order for them to, you know, kind of 
reap the benefits of their celebrity, they often went out dressed as their, who their persona was, right? So um, this story follows, a, like I said, a female customer who is a seamstress for one of these very, very famous men who is famous for playing female parts. And in the course, very quickly, in the course of the story, Charles lifts the ban on women being on the stage. What we find out is that the, the female seamstress, her whole dream, she wants to be an actress. She loves the theater. She's only a seamstress because women aren't allowed on the stage. She's desperate to get on the stage and to play these roles. And so when the ban is lifted, she tries her hand out at it. She's not very good at first, um, but she really wants to become better. And so she sort of enlists this guy who's so good at playing female roles for help with acting. And there comes a strange relationship that it it develops between them because as women are allowed onto the stage, what happens is all the men who are playing these female female roles fall out of favor because we can now recognize that they're just, you know, um, fakes. They're not, they're not really women. Why would I want to watch a man playing a woman when I could just watch a woman playing a woman? She's going to do a better job, right? And it's just fascinating too because people had never seen women on the stage. So there's a spectacle aspect to it. So these men who had made their whole career out of this were slowly becoming out of, out of favor and then almost didn't really know how to play the male parts as well because it's not what they did. And there was a lot of, I'm sure, struggle for them. And we see that struggle in the story that happens in Stage Beauty and kind of like the development of that and how this all comes to fruition through the relationship between this male actor and this woman who's trying to become an actress. So we're going to actually watch a little clip from the beginning of this film. Um, and uh, one, a couple things I want you to pay attention to. One is that uh, this, the space itself, the way the theater looks, right? Secondly is the interaction between the audience and the performers, because we're going to see way more of that than um, we would in our modern theater. Third, the style of acting that we see presented, which is really different from the style of acting that we're used to today. So let's be thinking about that as we watch this little clip from Stage Beauty. I know not where is that Promethean heat that can my life resume. She wakes. Who's there? Othello. Hi, Desdemona. Will you come to bed, my lord? Have you prayed tonight, Desdemona? I am, my lord. If you bethink yourself of any crime unreconciled as yet to heaven and grace, solicit for it straight. Alas, my lord. What do you mean by that? Well, do it. And be brief, I will walk by. I would not kill thy unprepared spirit. No heavens forfend. I would not kill thy soul. Talk you of killing. I, I do. What's the matter? That hand, kerchief, that I so loved and gave thee. Thou gavest to Cassio. No! By my life and soul, send for the man and ask him. Down! Come back. Kill me tomorrow, let me live tonight. Nay, if you strive. But half an hour. Being done, there is no pause. But what I say, one prayer. It is too late. <laughs> Wonderful. What uh, the, it's, it's fine that, that that's the, the clip that I wanted to show, but uh, what happens immediately after that moment is that the audience just erupts in applause and, and whistles and shouting. They think that the performance that the man playing Desdemona uh, um, has done is so fantastic. And it becomes so raucous that actually the, the actor who's supposed to be dead now actually has to raise their hand up and 
do something like this that indicates, hey guys, you need to be quiet because there's still more of the play, right? So what were some of the things that we saw there? Well, clearly a man playing a female part. Um, this is from um, Othello by Shakespeare, playing the part of Desdemona. Now, when Shakespeare would have had this play performed, when he was living and this play would have been performed that he wrote, there also would have been a man playing the role of Desdemona. Because again, no women were allowed on the stage. Um, so we see a, a man dressed as a woman playing this part, right? We um, also see a stage in which there isn't a lot of depth. And we're going to be talking about stages today, so I just want to point this out. Everything is pushed um, either right at the proscenium frame or onto the apron. And that was very typical for this time period. And we feel like a sense of con um, that there is a condensing, right? There isn't a lot of depth to what's happening. There's the bed, but you could see that Othello can't walk around the bed, right? Everything is shoved kind of into that upstage space. And the playing space is really in this downstage area and on the apron. Um, and there's also a two-dimensionality to kind of the way that the, the um, scenery itself is composed, right? Um, there's what we would consider very, very stylized and kind of dramatic and over-the-top acting, right? Um, there's a point at which the, the actor who's playing Othello kind of does this kind of a gesture, even shakes his hands like that. Um, and, you know, the, the putting of the pillow is so unrealistic, all these things, right? I think rather than thinking of it as being unrealistic, it's better to think about it as it being highly stylized, right? Highly theatrical. And this would have been a form that would be very, very familiar to these audience members. They would not be comfortable with the realistic style of acting that we have today, right? In fact, even though, if you ever watch this film, it's really interesting. There, at the very end of the film, um, we get a scene that is, the mirror of this scene, right? So it's the same scene in Othello, except Claire Danes, who plays the, the female se seamstress you saw behind the scenes mouthing all of Desdemona's lines, Claire Danes is playing Desdemona, and the character who is playing Desdemona in the version we just saw is now playing Othello, right? And they do the scene, and it starts out in a very similar way to what the way we saw this scene, very theatrical, very stylized. And then at some point, it kind of, it, it evolves into something much more realistic. And when they do this, the suffocation moment, it feels very realistic and frightening almost. And there's a reason for that. I won't give it away. There's also some really character-driven reasons why that happens, but the audience watching it is aghast. And when the Desdemona character, play, played by Cardanes, actually dies, it isn't this weird stylized, like, hand thing that happens, right, with their, you know, it, they think it might be real. And somebody actually starts crying because they think that they have actually witnessed someone be murdered in front of them, <laughs> right? And, and then something happens and they realize that it was actually all staged and it wasn't real. But now that would have never really happened on a stage uh, from this time. Even once women got on the stage, it was many, still many, a hundred years away before really realistic acting became in vogue. But the point is, is that the audiences at the time would not have even been prepared for that. They would have no concept of, of, or even why you would want to do something like that on the stage, right? So this kind of elevated style is in the same way that we think of poetry. When you read a book of poetry, you don't just want it to be common words and common constructions that you're used to hearing in your everyday life. When you read a poem or you read a book of poetry, you expect there to be elevation. The words should be prettier. The constructions should be more elaborate and fluid, and they have a sense about them that this is bigger than life. This is bigger than everyday language. And that is exactly what people went to the theater to see at this time, right? Acting wasn't supposed to be just like everyday life. It was supposed to be bigger than that. It was supposed to be more beautiful. It was supposed to be more elaborate. And that was how they interpreted it, was in this very, what we now consider over the top and overly dramatic, you know, way of doing things. 
Well, once this period is kind of over, actually Charles II, uh, Charles actually lives for quite a long time, he ends up dying. Um, we get a swing back in the opposite direction again, right? So we had this puritanical era with the Commonwealth. We swing uh, away from that with Restoration Theater into kind of this very body, very uh, off-color period of time where we're doing all kinds of crazy things on the stage. And then we see a complete swinging back that happens again in the 18th century with bourgeois drama and, again, the, with the Victorian morals coming in. So the laxity of morals gave way soon to the swing of the Pouch of Pendulum in the other direction towards the use of theater to use the lives of the middle class. So now, instead of focusing on the upper classes, we're going to focus on the middle class. And a concern for material things, but also a big concern with morality and um, and what we th what the, the time period thought was as proper morals and, and um, ethical behavior of the middle class, right? So plays like The Careless Husband, which reveal the true depth of a wife's love for her husband, um, these plays were often very, very sentimental. They were often predictable, which now nowadays we would call them predictable. For the time, they were just highly structured, yeah. Um, and the theaters themselves then also grew much bigger. So part of those changes were um, because things had gone so one way, um, and so now we're kind of swinging back to balance those out. And another thing that was driving this was a growing middle class. During this time, we're looking at the time period of the Industrial Revolution. We're looking at a time period in which more and more people are entering the workforce and able to earn a decent living. The middle class is growing. More of these people are now able to afford tickets to go see a show. So who are we going to put on the stage, just like we did with the aristocrats? We're going to put the middle class on the stage. And we're going to focus on good morals, the nuclear family, um, all these things that um, we think the middle class wants to hear about. So there were also domestic tragedies in which characters were punished for mistakes and sentimental comedies. Um, in which lovers uh, were rescued from misfortune. Because there's such a huge portion of the population that's actually going to see these, these shows now, one second, we get a lot of other things happening as a result, right? So instead of a theater being able to hold 500, we see theaters now in this time period that grow to hold 1,000 people, sometimes 2,000 people at a time. These are enormous theaters. And um, so theaters are making a lot of money off of these shows, right? And of course, there's still, um, you know, hierarchy in terms of seating, as there has always been, going all the way back, um, meaning that the people that have the more money and can afford the better tickets get to sit closer to the stage. The people that don't have to sit farther away or sit in more uncomfortable seats, right? But there are all kinds of things that result um, from the fact that we have a really large middle class going to see these shows because there are heated battles over the price of admission. So, for instance, uh, you know, the Covent Garden riots, there was a theater in Covent Garden that had closed down for a period of time and was renovating the inside of the theater to make it better, right, so, so that the seats would be better and all this. Um, the boxes... So if we can just, make, we'll just go to a quick close-up of this just so we can see what the boxes look like of this image. Can we go full screen on this image? Maybe. There we go. Um, so if you see what should be your left, the people that are seated in the side looks like the wall. Those are called box seats, right? And the more they are on the stage, the more expensive they are, right? This is actually a cartoon from the Covent Garden um, riots. So <clears throat> the... What you see in this, you don't really see the whole theater, right? So the, you see the orchestra, but what would be right in back of the orchestra would be the floor seats. Those are some of the cheapest seats. And then further back, even uh, cheaper, and then you get some usually riser seating behind that. But the box seats are the ones that are the most expensive ones, and they're the better seats to have, right? Even nowadays, box seats are the good seats, right? So the people who could afford those box seats were obviously rich people. And what this theater did was, as they were renovating, they, um, they had to raise, they raised their ticket prices to pay for the renovation. 
but where they put the extra cost was in the cheaper seats. So they raised the price of the cheaper seats <clears throat> where the middle class people would be sitting and they left the box seats prices the same as they had been before. Well, this felt incredibly unfair to the people who would be sitting in those, those regular seats, the middle class people, because here they were, the entire theater had been renovated, um, including the box seats, and then they were stuck with the bill, right? The middle class people, this is like reality, right, in terms of taxes. The middle class people are the ones uh, stuck with the, the bill for everything else while all of the other people get to just enjoy the benefits and not have to pay any of the taxes for it, right? So there was a riot. There was a giant riot about this. And they closed down the theater. And they rioted inside of the theater. And people actually got hurt. People, a couple people died as a result of these riots. People were very, very upset about this. It became so bad that the theater owners actually, like I said, closed down the theater and then recapitulated to, to the audience, as well they should have, right? And spread the cost of the renovation across all of the seats, including the expensive seats, right? This was not the only time that this happened, but it really just shows how important the middle, these, these everyday people had become and how many people were able to afford to go to the theater. And again, you might be thinking, well, <clears throat> what a classy time. Everyone's going to the theater and seeing all these shows. But you also have to remember this is a time in which there is really very little other things that are around to entertain you. You don't have a phone. You don't have a TV. You don't have radio. You don't have any of these things. The only way you're going to find entertainment is two ways. You're going to sit at home and entertain yourself by playing the piano, which is why so many people played an instrument during this time, right? Playing an instrument of some sort and singing, telling stories to each other, reading a book, or you're going to go out and you're going to go to the theater. You're going to go see music. You're going to, and that requires you to leave the house, right? So in a world in which there's very few forms of entertainment available to people, the ones that are available and the, the access that everyday people have to them become very, very important. So nowadays, maybe a corollary would be something like, imagine, you know, it's always such big news when like Netflix raises their prices or Disneyland raises their prices on something, right? I mean, certainly we don't have riots about that, but it is a similar feeling, right? Why? These are the things that are in my realm of how I entertain myself, and now you're making it more expensive for me to do that, right? And it is in the same way that these people were very upset about the cost of their entertainment forms being encroached upon, all right? It's also a sign that now the everyman is the one who really is uh, in, in control and uh, kind of navigating what happens in the world, the theatrical world, as opposed to the aristocrats. The, the middle class are the ones who are going to dictate the stories that they want to see, dictate um, the ticket prices and all that, because they're the, the majority body that's really going to see these shows. The Drury Lane Theatre was a really important theatre in London that um, it's still around today. Uh, one of the few from this time period that <clears throat> is still in operation. And this is really where we see, I mean, this is, you can even just see it from the picture. The size of this theater expands to hold over 2,000 people. This is a massive, massive theater. In fact, for now, nowadays, this is almost too big. You know, you almost wouldn't want to have a stage performance in this space because it's so enormous. And the people that are sitting at the back really can barely see the actors on the stage or even in the top levels of those boxes. But... This is the type of space that you needed to hold the audiences that were coming to these types of shows. You can imagine sitting in a space like that, this is much more like a sporting event, right? Than it is going to what we think of theater today. Even our big space here on campus only holds 454 people. I mean, that's a fraction of what we see being held in these bigger theaters at the time. And there was a huge desire for a spectacle People wanted to see fires, floods, earthquakes, real animals. Um, these stages were enormous. You could bring things like elephants were brought onto stage. Um, and like ships, there's a story of um, a, a, a play that was performed where they actually created something so that they could flood the stage. And they had like almost a full size reproduction of a, a ship's hull on the stage. <laughs> There was all kinds of things 
that were happening as we get later into the 18th century. We get something known as an elevator or a shifting stage. And this is where we get a three level stage. It's pretty impressive and amazing where we can shift. You would have this set, right? And then this stage is really an elevator. So you can press a, well, it's not a button. It's a dolly system, right? You, you pull the rope and uh, the entire stage goes up. Let's see if we can go back to me just so you can see what I'm saying, right? The entire stage goes, that scene moves up, right? And underneath there's another whole entire stage, right? And then when we're done seeing that, that one goes down and the next one comes. And then when we're done, that one goes down and there's one above that. So there would be three tiers and this is the way they could play different scenes or uh, it change locations dramatically and we could have really, really radical and different things happening. Um, it is a moment in time that harkens back to um, the Romans and their Colosseums and the sort of spectacular events that they would do and use um, in those Colosseum events. And we're really, uh, we have these enormous audiences that, you know, it's like a blockbuster film. When you've got enormous audiences, and even though all of them are only paying a little bit, that adds up to a lot, a lot, a lot of money, right? It's why you can do a film like Avengers Infinity War that costs millions of dollars to make, right? Well, why? Because millions of people are going to see it, and even though they're going to just be paying a little bit each, that really adds up, and so we know that we're going to make a profit. In the same way, this was the blockbuster era of, of theater, and they were doing all of the similar things in terms of spectacle, live horses on stage, all kinds of crazy things happening on stage to keep those audiences coming in and um, paying those ticket prices to see these shows. This is also an era in which the genre, all the subgenres that we have today, or many of them, evolve out of. So when you think of a pirate film, like Pirates of the Caribbean, or you think of uh, science fiction or horror or any of those things, those genres uh, evolved, even medical drama, right, out of this era. Um, before that, it really was comedy, uh, romantic comedy, drama, tragedy. Those were like the two <laughs> big things. But this really, um, this era is where we get so much of those subgenres flowering out and becoming a thing we have. I'm, a lot of people think of the 18th century and melodrama and Victorian theater as being kind of, um, you know, I don't know, boring, but like very... Uh, stereotypical and uh, ridiculous, and certainly it was, but there is so much that we owe to this period of time in terms of spectacle, in terms of uh, the subgenres that we have now, in terms of structure, storytelling structure, the types of structures that we use today for storytelling all come out of this era. And it is in part because we had these enormous audiences and all of this money flowing into this part, this way of entertaining people, that we get all the things that we see flourishing um, and becoming film later on, right? And the stories that we get to enjoy now. All right. Well, that brings us through restoration and all of the 18th century melodrama and uh, Victorian theater um, in terms of our little venture into theater history. I thought I wasn't going to take a break, but I think I am going to take a little break. If we could just take a five-minute break because we... we um, have some other things to go over. Um, in the second part of our broadcast today, we are going to be talking about stages and types of stages um, and looking at the different type of theater spaces. Um, remember that um, we don't need to flash it on the screen again, but just remember we are live and online, so maybe be thinking about the question you want to ask or if there's something that you want to answer the question that I posed to you today for your extra credit, this second half of the broadcast is a perfect time to do that. But let's just take a quick five-minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll finish off today's broadcast. So I'll see you back here in five. You are watching DHTV from California State University to Vegas Hills.
feeling I had when I was here as a student was that I could do anything. Sure, keep striving and keep reaching high, but at the same time, also lift up those around you. I want to get up and work hard to change things for the future, to make things better. How do I make my passion come to life? How can I share that experience? How to shape and engage the community. Get hands-on into making a difference. My name is McConan. My name is Johnny. My name is Amaranta, and I'm a Toro. with people who share the same goals as you. If you believe it, you can do it. DHTV from California State University to Vegas Hills. Hello and welcome back to Theater 100, television, film, and theater. So today, um, in the last part of our broadcast, we are going to be talking about the audience and theater spaces and how um, theater, this, the shape of the theater, the way the theater is designed, um, actually impacts our experience of the, the performance. So I do wanna remind you we are live and online and I wanna remind you of our extra credit question for today. Our phone number is 310-928-7330. If you'd like to call in and answer and give a comment or a question, you can also type in at askthtvlive at gmail.com. And our question for today is, what do you think would be the best staging format to see a play in, proscenium, arena, or thrust? And why would you use one over the other? Um, you can always feel free to type in or call in with another question or comment, but let's use the rest of our time here to go over the spaces and um, start thinking about that. So what are the areas um, of a theater space? Uh, well, composed inside of the theater space is obviously um, when we look at the proscenium stage, which is one style of stage. Um, we have the fourth wall, we have the orchestra, we have boxes, the fly loft, and the wings. Um, but let's go back and let's talk about what is a proscenium. So there are different types of theaters. The proscenium is the one you may be the most familiar with. And the proscenium theater is a picture frame theater with a proscenium arch through which the audience watches the actors. And the basic purpose is illusory and requires designed scenery. So behind me, you see an example of a proscenium stage, right? One of the things you see here is to your left, that's where the audience sits. And then we see um, right in front of the stage is where the orchestra would be. If we have musicians, that's where we put them. They play music from that space. They are semi-concealed from the audience. Then we see the proscenium frame. 
that is that border that goes all the way around the playing space, right? It almost looks like a picture frame. It frames the stage, and that is where the proscenium stage gets its name. Um, on the side here, because we are looking at it kind of with this cutaway version, this is not what an audience would see. If we can make that wall disappear, which is what this image does, we see that we have above the stage some things that hang, and that's called the fly loft. That's the area where scenery can be hung or flown in from. It's also where light ha lights hang. And we see in this particular, this is an old style stage, we have three different drops, which are intended to create a sense of um, depth to the stage. And they are hung on battens, which are flown out of the fly loft, meaning that there's a space above there where they hang on beams. Um, if we had electrical lighting, we would also have those hung on something called electrics that hang um, in that space as well and shine light onto the stage. Where we look now, where you see that ladder, if you can see in that first space between the proscenium frame and the um, first set of drops, there's a little ladder. It looks like a man or a bucket or something sitting at the top. That space right there is called the wings, right? So this is, so this is space on the stage uh, left or right, either the left or right side of the stage, where the audience cannot see, but where there is space for you know, offstage things to happen. Oh, we also see here on the bottom, you can see actors waiting in the wings, right? So that's what it means to wait in the wings. It means to wait in this offstage space on the left or the right, where the audience cannot see, um, but where actors and, and technicians are free to move and do things in a way that's out of view from the audience. So good, we can come away from that photo now. So um, we kind of we just talked through while looking at that picture most of the, the spaces. So again, let's just give a, a more technical definition of the wings. Again, it's that offstage space left and right. So left and right offstage areas or narrow standing pieces of scenery or curtains. Those curtains can also be called legs that stand parallel to the proscenium and form scenery or masking for the sides behind the arch, so behind that picture frame space. Good, here's another image to give us a kind of overhead view. And all the machinery is obscured behind the walls and flats, right? So again, it's a space here we can see, this is now like an overhead view. Let's look at the very top of your screen. That represents the back wall of the stage. And then if we look down at the bottom of the screen, that's where the audience would be sitting, facing forward to look at the stage. Uh, the two uh, little blocks, uh, rectangles, that have <coughs> diagonal lines around them are representing the base feet of the proscenium. And we look through that picture frame to the stage. And then we can see that those base feet of the proscenium obscure what is our left wing, right? Our wing stage left and our wing stage right. And this is where, again, uh, technicians may stand in that space, actors wait and stand in that space, scenery may be set in that space that's gonna get wheeled out in a moment, right? Lots of things that we don't want the audience to see that help to create the magic of theater, <laughs> um, but we, do, we want to remain unseen um, until we want them shown to the audience. And so the wings are a really important part of the theatrical space. They allow us to create kind of you know, entrances for actors as well as really magical things to happen um, on, you know, as, as things are brought on and off the stage. So, Teatro Farnese um, is probably one of the first proscenium arches in the world. This is in Italy. Uh, we get the proscenium stage from the Italians. The next people to adopt it were probably the French, and then it spread all over Europe. And it grew out of the use of perspective painting, right? The idea that we could paint in such a way to create a, a false vanishing point. We could use forced perspective to create a sense of depth on the stage that did not actually exist in real life. Giacomo Torelli um, was one of the first people to create a set for a proscenium stage. And the, this is an example of it. And the Renaissance ideal was for the audience to watch from the other end of the theater. Ooh, I've never seen this color image, guys. Really nice. <laughs> Um, thus separating them from the before, that's just really, I've always only ever seen that black and white one. Um, so they perfected this style of painting, and I think this, actually, this color image really shows how it works. This would have been a painted flat, so just a flat canvas, right? You can even you get the same effect just from seeing it on the screen behind me. It feels like that, that, that image draws back, and there's all this depth to the image. And if this was a stage, it would feel like this stage was really, really big and long. But actually, it's just this image is created through 
um, the use of perspective, forced perspective, right? Where we create the things that are supposed to be closer to us are bigger, and then we draw through the use of geometry, we draw a vanishing point that comes at the very back, and then things get progressively smaller as they head towards that back area. And it allows us to feel as though there's a sense of elongation and space and three-dimensionality three that does not actually exist. So um, when we move forward in time, all the way forward in time, and into the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, we see that the uh, Moscow Art Theater actually perfects this idea. They take it a step further. They take it out of just painting 3D sets. They create real 3D sets. And they still use the proscenium, but they create three-dimensional sets that have real depth and real height and all of that. And um, we also have box sets that come into play that have three whole walls, right? And when, if any of you go and see Seven Guitars, which is playing on our main stage opening this weekend on Friday, February 14th, and playing in through until next weekend, um, you'll see a beautiful, beautiful box set a unit set, and it fills, it's on a proscenium stage, and it just fills the stage really, really beautifully, and it has natural depth because it's actually three-dimensional, right? We don't have to paint that it's three-dimensional. It really is three-dimensional, and the depth is created through, through the realistic um, three-dimensionality of it, right? So we get that through there. Another important aspect of uh, our modern stage, which we talked about a little bit when we were looking at stage beauty, is the idea of the fourth wall. And the fourth wall is a really important term. It's a modern term. It did not evolve until the late 18th century, early 19th century. Um, and it came out of um, the fact that realism was becoming the dominant form of theater at the time. Um, so what is the fourth wall? The fourth wall is the idea of an imaginary wall that actors were to believe existed at the proscenium line to increase their naturalistic plane. But it's not just an idea that exists for actors, it actually impacts the audience as well, right? Because the audience also pretends that there is an imaginary wall at the proscenium line, which we can see here, right? There's the fourth wall, the set is all behind it, and we just imagine that there's this invisible wall there that, um, and we just magically get to look through it as the audience. So what does that mean? Well, it means that audiences today behave very differently than they would have in the Restoration period or in the Elizabethan period. There was no concept of a fourth wall in the Elizabethan period when people were performing Shakespeare. There was no concept of a fourth wall in the Restoration period, in the French neoclassical period. For hundreds and thousands of years, there was no concept of a fourth wall. It's a very modern invention. So it not only changes the way the actors perform, it asks them to pretend as though they are really doing this thing and there's no audience watching them and they should be as naturalistic as humanly possible while still being able to communicate their lines so the audience can hear them and see them. But it also requires that the audience sit quietly and also buy in to this imaginary situation, right? So that we also pretend as audience members that we are just peering, almost being like peeping toms, looking through this invisible wall, and we should be quiet because we don't want to disturb these people who are living this real experience on the stage, right? We don't want to let them know that we're here. Um, and there are certain acceptable things we can do, like we can laugh if we think something's funny, or we can applaud if we like something, we can quietly gasp, right? But we shouldn't shout at the actors, right? We shouldn't say things to the actors. That breaks this whole entire reality that we've created, that there's this wall separating us. If we alert them to the fact that we're here, then suddenly like the whole magic ends, right? Um, so it's a really interesting way that we have constructed our modern theater because it requests um, our willing suspension of disbelief in a really a way that no other audience has ever been asked to behave inside of the theater. And it necessarily uh, creates a relationship between the actors and the audience that is really, really different from almost any other point in time. Um, we are, as performers today, probably more disconnected from our audiences than any other moment in time. 
right? Because we are asked as performers to completely ignore the audience almost, right? We acknowledge them like this much, but the rest of the time we're supposed to pretend that you're not even there. And the same thing for the audience. They're supposed to sit quietly and not alert us to their presence. Um, and so um, you get this very, very different relationship that really has not existed until recent history. Well, let's move on and let's talk about some of the other ways that uh, stages might be composed. So the, the next one that we're going to talk about is arena theater, which is also called theater in the round. And this is a theater with a plain space in the center of a square or a circle with seats for spectators all around it. <clears throat> Usually the stage is raised um, or the audience is raised so that we can actually uh, see the performance that's happening. The advantage of this is that it provides a lot more intimacy with the performers as well as with the audience. There's a better view for everybody usually. Um, and it's got low design requirements. And the reason for that is that we have to limit all of our scenery to being about, and furniture pieces to being about two feet tall. Otherwise, if an actor steps behind a piece that's too tall, there's gonna be a portion of the audience that isn't gonna be able to see them, right? So in these kinds of spaces, we have very, very low scenic requirements. Um, what happens is that the space, the play becomes dominated by the, the costumes and uh, the lights. And um, it's a really, really unique way to watch a show. Obviously, some of the very first spaces that were like this were the Greeks. The Romans also had arena staging. The Colosseums are a perfect example of that. Excuse me. Um, but we do have stages that are like this too. The Guthrie, which is here in Southern California, is a stage that is in the round. Um, it's a modern stage that operates in the round. That is, its, it's um, preset is uh, this kind of in the rounds. There we go. The Guthrie is a perfect example of uh, something that seeks to sort of replicate that style. It's not true 360 degrees, but it's very much akin to what uh, the Greeks had in terms of the style of arena seating that would be, we have it on, on almost all the way around us, right? The advantage of this style, which you can see here, this is the Guthrie, is that with this partial arena seating, we still get to have um, some walls in the back, right? So we get kind of the benefits of, of the round without having to have no real scenery at all, right? Um, and we still get to the intimacy and we get lots of great viewing angles for the audience, real, like I said, real intimate setting where you feel like you're kind of in the space with them. But we, we also get to have some walls in the back, which can be nice in terms of uh, really creating theatrical magic. So obviously the theater of Dionysus, one of the theaters that we saw back there, um, began with that circle, even though again, this is more of a thrust as well as the one, the Guthrie is more of a thrust as well. Um, and we kept that for a really long period of time. When we move into medieval drama, they do a similar thing with the pageant wagons where um, you, this is a, a fairly good example. We've got one of the wagons there where the scenes would take place. Um, what would happen is there'd be a whole bunch of those wagons and they would circle them in a semicircle and the audience would sit around those wagons and watch the different scenes take place, a different scene on each wagon. All right, the next stage that we're going to talk about is a thrust theater. This is a combination of proscenium and arena, which is what we saw in um, the Guthrie, right? And this is where audience sits on three sides, enclosing a stage which protrudes into the center. Um, now you can have it shaped like this, which is kind of like a partial arena stage, right? Or you can also have a different kind in which it's the part that thrusts out isn't circular like that. It's more like a, a, a square it's a, or a rectangle that thrusts out into the audience. And we can see that in actually in the Elizabethan good, the Elizabethan stage, the globe, uh, the old globe theater was a classic thrust stage. So here we see audience still seated around three sides. We have a meh, kind of a proscenium-esque stage at the back, but what we really have is this stage that juts out into the audience space, and that's really where most of the playing takes place, right? That's where most of the action and the acting takes place. Um, and this is actually a drawing 
of, I'm not sure if it is of the Old Globe, but it's of obviously an Elizabethan, uh, Elizabethan stage. And if you go to the new Old Globe, the San Wanamaker Theater, which is a reproduction of what they believe the globe looked like, what you'll see is this thrust stage, um, if you're actually watching a play, audience stands all around that thrust, right? So the intention is not that the thrust would stand there alone and people only sit in the galleries, which are those seated areas. The intention is that that space thrusts out directly into the audience and the audience surrounds it on all sides. So what are the advantages of, of, of that style, style of stage? Well, we get two advantages. Um, like I said, with the Guthrie, we get the advantage that we do get to have some back wall, right, that allows for concealed entrances and exits and some scenery. But we get the intimacy um, of what is more an arena style stage, right? We get audience and performers being right up with each other and kind of almost on top of each other. And the, the, the playing space itself is jutting out into the audience to kind of increase this connection. So um, the Swan Theater, which is what we just saw, right? So that, that was not the globe, but is a famous sketch from the Elizabethan era. And it shows that platform stage thrusting out into the yard. And of course, the old globe was exactly, yes. Yeah, so this is the Swan. Uh, I had a feeling it wasn't the globe. Um, so this is the Swan, and it juts out like that. But the globe really was built, all of the theaters from that time were built in a very, very similar fashion. One of the sad things about the globe um, is that even though it is the most famous of all of those stages, it is the one that we have the least amount of information about in terms of how it was actually constructed. So again, if you ever go back to the San Wanamaker Theater, that's what it's called now, but it's really just the new Old Globe. It stands not where the Old Globe really stood. It stands probably, I think, 500 feet away from where the Old Globe actually was. It's right on the Thames. Um, but the way they constructed that was through a variety of ways because there are no drawings. There's no ground plans or anything. They had to reconstruct the, the, the theater from what we saw. They had drawings of the swan. They have a really, really detailed description of what the globe looked like. And then they had drawings of also other contemporaneous theaters and other drawings um, like there's a big drawing of uh, Elizabethan England, um, like a map almost, that was drawn that was contemporaneous, and you see the globe in there. It's a very, very tiny. But they used all that, corroborated all that historical source material together to try to kind of get a sense of, and they've done a really fantastic job, and I'm sure that it looks, if not exactly like it looked, very, very close. So Shakespeare's globe as well as the Spanish corrales were also designed in this way. So these are, you know, the three main types of stages that you'll come into contact with in terms of you going out and seeing theater in a real world setting. Proscenium stages, which have the picture frame around it. A thrust stage, which is kind of like this arena, half arena style with the, the stage thr thrusting out, jutting out into the audience space. And then a true in the round or true arena space where audience is seated all the way around a circular center where the playing space is or sometimes a square center, right? These aren't the only types of stages that exist, but these are the three main types that exist. So we're just gonna kind of quickly go through what are um, the rest of the types, and I'll, I'll try and say a few words about each of them, but these are really much rarer, less common, um, if you do get to see some theater in this space, they can be really beautiful and unique experiences, but they're not the ones that are predominant when we go to see theater in professional spaces. Um, and then just as a little note, guys, today we are going to, we're not going to be here for the, we're about five minutes away from ending today. Um, our lecture today is just the hour and a half. We had less to talk about as opposed to last week and the week before that. Um, so today we will be ending at around 1.30, just so you know. All right, so what are some of these other spaces? Well, created and found spaces. That's one style of space that we can um, have. What does that mean? I actually did a show um, right out of college where we used a found space. So we did a play called I Never Saw Another Butterfly. It's supposed to take place in a bunker, right? Um, and we actually had a bunker <laughs> that we performed it in. We were in San Pedro. We went to Fort MacArthur where they actually had a space that we could use and we rent it. It used to actually be... Um, a military space, 
and we put chairs in it with risers and we made it into a theatrical space. So a found space is basically a space that's already existing that we turn into a theatrical space through the use of um, putting theatrical lights in and, and platforms and all kinds of things so that it can be turned into a playing space. And that could be all kinds of things. It could be a park. It could be a, a room like this. It could be a classroom. It could be anything. Non-theater buildings. So Cornerstone Theater is known for using, it's a theater company here in LA, for using non-theater spaces and turning them in to theatrical spaces. They did a show, I, if I'm remembering the name of it right, it's Prometheus Unbound. And it was a story about steel workers in the middle of the country. And they actually went and performed it in an abandoned steel factory, right? And they turned this abandoned steel factory into a theatrical space. Right? So this is a space that was never intended to have theater performed inside of it. And through their imagination and hard work, they turned this into a space. There's amazing pictures of that if you ever get a chance to see it. There are adapted spaces. So there are spaces that maybe weren't intended to be a theater space at first, but then we do a lot of things. We renovate, we bring in grids, and we can turn them into theatrical spaces. There's street theater. So we can literally just create a stage and perform a theater. And it doesn't mean on the street necessarily. It might mean on the sidewalk, or it might mean like in a park somewhere. Or it might mean um, you know in a, a, a public space somewhere where theater isn't typically seen. We can create a theatrical experience in one of those spaces as well. Uh, Multi-focus environments. These are really, really interesting. Very, very rare to see but they do exist. And this is where things might be happening in multiple locations. So we did something similar to this some years ago here on our campus. We did a play called Every Man the Musical. And we did, um, it was, it's a multi-focus, but it also a mix of site-specific, where we started out in our proscenium theater, then we divided our audience into three halves, and then each portion of that audience walked to a different location inside of the theater and watched a different portion of the play um, in different orders. It's a very ambitious thing we did. And so some of them were outside behind the theater, some of them were in our small theater, some of them were up in our lobby in this, uh, this wall area. We took people to all these different locations um, to see different things. Um, true multifocus is where you're all in one space, but you turn your focus because at certain points in time, maybe the action's happening in front of you, but then suddenly action's happening behind you and you've all got to turn around to watch that action. So this doesn't happen in a space that has fixed seating, right? Because if you imagine if you're in a fixed seating place where your chair is literally bolted to the ground and suddenly action is taking place behind you, you now can't watch that without standing up and turning around. So these kinds of spaces, that's why it's so rare to see them is because it's usually a repurposed space and you have um, your audience either on stools or benches or you have them stood and it can't take place for very long because again, asking people to stand for more than several minutes can be very difficult. So, but it's where I might be watching something in front of me and then something's happening behind me. I have to turn around to watch that and then something's happening on my side and now I'm going to turn to watch that. Finally, we also have something called an all-purpose theater space, also called a black box. And this is something we also have here. This is a space which is literally just a black room, um, usually with a, a booth where we have all of our, our, you know, our controlling, our light board and all that. But that even that can be moved around. And we can repurpose the space. We have a multi-purpose grid on top. And we can repurpose the space so that we can do proscenium, we can do theater in the round, we can do tennis court seating, we can do anything we want inside of that space. All right, guys. Phew. Um, so today we have gone over restoration and 18th century theater. We um, have talked about theater stages and spaces and the types of spaces that you'll commonly see as well, some uncommon spaces and stages. Um, and like I said, next week we're going to be going over Raisin in the Sun. And this week, just to remind you again, you have your traditional uh, discussion board that you need to do. I did get to grading all the ones for the first two weeks. Um, I haven't graded the third week yet. But I usually tend to do them at two weeks at a time. Um, 
<clears throat> Somebody had emailed me and said that I missed theirs. Don't worry, I'll go back and fix that. Sometimes I make mistakes. I always go back and fix them. Just alert me to it. Um, and uh, your test on this chapter, and then next week we're going to be going on to Raisin in the Sun. All right? So, guys, we covered everything today. I do see that someone typed in, but we really don't have time to go over it, so I'll make sure to take your name down, Diana, and you will get your extra credit. And um, we'll be back next week with A Raisin in the Sun. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next week.